America has a long and storied history with guns. Our founding fathers want our independence with guns. And for the 246 years that our nation has existed, Americans have fed our families and protected our homes by using guns. When confronted with the tragic realities of how people abuse guns on our shores to commit violent acts and claim innocent lives, the debate erupts once again over what some consider to be an intrinsically American pursuit. The ownership and use of guns, the right to bear arms, is outlined in the Second Amendment of our Bill of Rights. If you've never heard the actual amendment before, it reads like this. A well-regulated militia, being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms, shall not be infringed. Now, the language of this has often been debated, and while advocates for gun ownership insist that the amendment cannot and should not ever be changed, the Supreme Court actually ruled that the amendment is speaking about the collective rights of a state to defend itself against outsiders, or even the national government, back in 1939. They determined that the well-regulated militia, being necessary to the security of a free state, is the key phrase here, and that the amendment offered no protection of individual rights to bear arms at all. That is, until 2008, when the Supreme Court ruled that Washington, D.C.'s handgun ban was unconstitutional under the Second Amendment and restored individual rights to firearms in a 5-4 to four decision. This was strengthened again in 2010, when the Supreme Court ruled that Chicago's handgun ban was deemed unconstitutional under the 14th Amendment in another 5-4 to four decision. Our right to individually keep and use firearms is the strongest that it's ever been in American history. And maybe it should be. Yes, there are more mass shootings now than ever, but that's because the world is more dangerous, and the only way to protect ourselves from that violence is by having guns of our own, right? We hear this idea a lot, the idea of a good guy with a gun who could have stopped violent crimes in their tracks and that having guns in the home deters potential robbery and violence. This time last year, according to a Gallup poll, 63% of Americans believed that having a gun in the home made their home safer. However, this idea simply isn't true. A study from the Boston Children's Hospital and the Harvard School of Public Health used CDC survey data on gun ownership from 2001, 2002, and 2004, the only years that they've ever been allowed to study the topic. What the researchers found was that the states with the lowest rates of gun ownership, like Massachusetts, Rhode Island, New York, California, Hawaii, New Jersey, Maryland, and Illinois, all had significantly lower rates of firearm-related assault, firearm-related homicide, and overall homicide than other states, while states with the most gun ownership, like Wyoming, Idaho, Arkansas, and Arizona, had 6.8 times as many firearm assaults, 2.8 times as many gun-related deaths, and twice as many murders overall as the states with the fewest guns in them. Wait, wait, wait. You may be saying. Lieberman, how can Illinois have lower gun deaths than other states? Chicago has some of the strongest gun control laws in the country, and yet they have some of the highest murder and violent crime rates in the U.S. Obviously, gun control doesn't work. Here's the thing. It's not that cut and dry. This isn't a 2 plus 2 equals 4 situation. It's a solve for X situation, and X is a product of the police's inability to curb the city's gang violence in the midst of a massive depopulation. The Chicago police force is incredibly underfunded. As of 2013, it was widely reported that the Chicago PD has about a thousand fewer officers than it needs to enforce the law effectively, and had key anti-gang initiatives like their anti-gang task force disbanded by Mayor Rahm Emanuel. In addition, depopulation has led to losses of working and middle-class jobs in the city, causing desperation and more potential for crime. While it is more difficult to legally acquire a gun in Chicago, it's not that difficult to, say, cross state lines to Wisconsin, a state with some of the loosest gun laws on the record, and bring them home to the Windy City. To say that gun control doesn't work at all because of the so called Chicago argument is simply not true. However, at the end of the day, isn't the Second Amendment on the books so that we can defend ourselves against our government should they infringe upon our rights? Without guns, we're defenseless if Washington turns on us. Yes, that is inherently true. But the U.S. military spent $598.5 billion last year alone. No matter what kind of private arsenal a civilian can accrue, no matter what level of training they can acquire, a civilian or a group of civilians cannot effectively defend themselves against a government that can drone strike them into a Oblivion. The federal government has 7,000 drones in their arsenal, with Predator and Reaper drones that cost $2,500 to $3,000 per hour to fly. And the 2016 budget for federal drone research and production is some $2.9 billion. The fact is, if there was ever a war between our well-armed militia and the U.S. government, we already lost. And to oppose legislation that could prevent another Orlando, Newtown, Charlotte, or Sandy Hook on those grounds is frankly as ill-informed as it is irresponsible. Guns are the American business. According to PolitiFact, as of 2013, it was estimated that there are over 50,000 licensed gun sellers and retailers in the United States. That includes gun stores, large retailers such as Walmart that sell guns,
guns in certain locations, pawn shops that sell guns, and individuals licensed to sell guns at gun shows. That's a thousand places to buy a gun for each of our 50 states, or for each of the victims in the Orlando shooting this past Sunday. For scale, that's about the number of McDonald's restaurants, Subway restaurants, and Starbucks locations in the United States combined. You know that old joke about a Starbucks across the street from a Starbucks? This is like a gun dealer across from a gun dealer next to a gun dealer inside of a gun store inside of a Walmart that sells guns. Now, it's hard to determine how many of those 50,000 are year-round gun stores versus pawnbrokers, large businesses, or private sellers. Neither the U.S. Census Bureau nor the U.S. Chamber of Commerce keep data on gun stores. However, Andrew Mulchan, the president of the Professional Gun Retailers Association, told PolitiFact in 2013 that he thought 25,000 of the 50,000 are businesses that sell guns, while the other half were private sellers. That's still about 2,000 more gun retailing businesses than Subway's over 23,000 locations in the United States. A lot of liberals blame the size and unchecked nature of the American gun business on the National Rifle Association, or NRA. They claim that the NRA spends insane amounts of money convincing politicians to vote for looser gun laws. And while this practice does exist, the numbers are more tame than some would have you believe. In 2014, the NRA donated $809,462 to federal candidates and campaign contributions, and spent $14.3 million in marketing for pro-gun candidates and against anti-gun candidates. That's a lot of money, but certainly a far cry from the conspiracy level millions and billions that some would claim. Has anyone asked you recently how much money taxpayers shell out annually because of gun sales and gun violence? Business Insider broke down a Mother Jones report last April, which revealed that gun violence costs American taxpayers $229 billion a year, or about $700 per person, and they call that a conservative estimate. For reference, that's about $12.8 million a day, every day. 87% of federal costs that stem from gun violence fall on taxpayers, mostly medical costs of shooting victims. On average, each gun-related injury in the U.S. cost $583,000 in hospitalization alone. For reference, the Orlando nightclub massacre was only one of 43 reported shootings in the United States on Sunday. For each victim that goes to the hospital, they pay and we pay. In addition, we pay $5.2 billion a year in prison costs for people who commit gun-related crimes, and we've paid $811 million total on better school security since Columbine in the 1990s. At the end of the day, when confronted with the prospect of having fewer guns and potentially being defenseless, we have to consider whether or not gun control would actually make us safer. If it can be proved, as we did earlier, that having more guns in states like Arkansas, Arizona, and Wyoming makes them less safe instead of more safe, can it also be proved that having fewer guns out there makes it less likely that people will feel that they need one to defend themselves? Australia has had success by ratifying a ban on automatic weapons, with no mass shootings at all since the ban was implemented in 1996. In fact, the rate of gun deaths in Australia today is 1 in 100,000 per year. At the end of 2015, the rate of gun deaths in America was 1 in 24,640, more than four times as likely. Recently, a reporter for the Philadelphia Inquirer was able to buy an AR-15, the same rifle used in the shootings in Orlando, Newtown Elementary, Aurora, Colorado, San Bernardino, and Umpqua Community College. She bought it in just seven minutes for $759.99 at a Philadelphia gun shop where it was on display as the gun of the week. The AR-15 is referred to as America's rifle by the NRA. The AR-15, which can shoot 45 bullets per minute, is legal, costs about as much as a 60-inch TV, and takes about the same amount of time and effort to purchase. However you feel about the right to own a weapon, maybe this one gun is one that we can live without. Ronald Reagan, one of the most celebrated conservative presidents in history, supported the 1994 ban on assault weapons in America. Can we today ban just one gun? Not all guns. This one. It's a start. You can click the link in the description below to find a petition to ban the AR-15. I'm Matt Lieberman. Thanks for watching.